Okay, so welcome to the evening session of the conference. Uh, uh, the first speaker will be Glenn Barnich from uh, the Free University of Brussels and Solvay International Institutes. And he will tell us about co-joint representation of BMS4 on celestial Riemann surfaces. Uh, please go ahead and you can share the screen. Okay, first of all, let me thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak at this prestigious conference. So, uh, my talk is uh, in the context of asymptotically flat gravity at null infinity. And the symmetry group in this context is the so called BMS4 group. And what I will try to show you today is how to construct in detail the co-joint representation uh, of this group. So this is a fairly straightforward technical question, but I hope that in the course of uh, setting it up the way I do, uh, you will recognize some of the techniques that you might like, or that might be useful to generalizations uh, to other infinite dimensional groups. So more concretely, this kind of group and its co-joint representation is relevant for celestial holography, for uh, scattering amplitudes, uh, uh, between sky minus and sky plus, and also for semi-classical uh, quantum gravity. Uh, let me start almost with the conclusions. So one kind of things you might want to do with uh, the co-joint representation is that you want to classify the co-joint orbits because the co-joint orbits are symplectic manifolds and they can be quantized. And then there is a direct uh, or an indirect relation to unitary reducible representations of the group, as in the program set up uh, by Kirillo for a long time ago. And one particular instance of this uh, quantization has been done in the late 80s by Alexeyev, Fadeyev, and Shatashvili. And they have written so-called geometric actions. They are kind of effective actions for Goldstone bosons. So the usual way you do that when you have a Lie group is to write an action like trace g minus one d mu g squared. But so suppose you don't have a trace in your group, like if you're interested in the Virasoro group, for instance, then you still can write an action if you use a co-joint vector to pair the Lie group, the Lie algebra element uh, in this group. And this is what they have done. Then they have path, they have done a path integral quantization of some standard groups and shown the relations to the characters of the group that you get from the path integral uh, formulas. Uh, if you do this for three-dimensional gravity, uh, you, you can do it for the groups which are relevant, BMS3 or two copies of the uh, Virasoro group. Then it turns out that the geometric actions that you get are very closely related to the ones that you get from the other construction, which is starting from the chan simons formulation of gravity and then in the presence of boundary or boundary conditions, you get the reduction to uh, chiral mesomino witten theories on the boundary, and then also a further reduction to Lubin's theory. So it turns out that this is another way to get such actions. And since in four dimensions, one cannot really solve the constraints in the action so easily, uh, this other avenue is available to, to cover some sector of four-dimensional gravity, uh, by this alternative technique. Okay, so I will start with some very straightforward remarks on co-joint representation for semi-direct product groups, and then I will go uh, in some detail through the construction uh, on the sphere, but also on the punctured plane, which is interesting from the conformal field theory point of view. And finally, I will show you how to identify this core joint representation in the gravitational data uh, that you see up at, uh, at sky plus. So of course, you know that if you have a matrix group, uh, the core joint representation is basically given by the transpose of the structure constants. Uh, and if you have a semi-direct product groups like the Euclidean group, uh, the Poincaré group, or its gravitational versions in, uh, in flat space-time, the BMS3 group or the BMS4 group, they all have the same structure of being, so there is a non-abelian group, the rotations, uh, 
which act in a semi-direct way on uh, Nabilian ideal, which are generically called here translations. Uh, so and so you have this group representation, and of course the differential of this group representation is what determines the commutator of the non-abelian generators with the abelian generators. So the dual space then has of course uh, uh, dual vectors for the non-abelian part, which we will call angular momentum, and the dual vectors for the abelian part will be called linear momentum. And two crucial ingredients in the construction of the core joint representation is, of course, the cogredient representation of the abelian, of the non abelian action of the group on the, if you want, linear momentum. So that's the straightforward definition. But there is something which is a bit less straightforward. So you, you just have to sit down a moment to work it out, which is this called this so called uh, cross product. And it turns out that if you think about angular momentum, this is really the change in angular momentum that you get when you do a translation due to the orbital part, if you want, of, uh, of angular momentum. And this is quite generic. So the core joint representation on the level of the, uh, the algebra has the following structure. So the core joint representation of the non-abelian part, then there is this cross product here, alpha, times p, which goes into the angular momentum. And then there is the, uh, the action of the, if you want, the non-abelian, the dual action of the non-abelian generators on linear momentum, which you can see here. So the next step in the construction, and maybe let me go quickly over it for people who are not so familiar with this, is, is to look at how the BMS4 and the Poincaré algebra uh, look at, when you look at it from the point of view of the celestial sphere. So the starting point is the standard representation of the Poincaré algebra in terms of uh, global coordinates on Minkowski space through first order differential operators. You define your boost and your rotation generators. And then you have this structure constants, which you get really by uh, doing the commutator between this first order differential operator. And then you do something a bit uh, unusual, which is instead of using these flat coordinates, you go to retarded uh, time coordinates and spherical coordinates. You write down what your generator look like, and they look fairly complicated. Of course, the commutation relations are still those of the Poincaré. But then there's a simplification that occurs. It turns out that you can look at these generators and drop all terms which are subleading in R, so and, and which contain the partial with respect to R. So if you drop all these terms and you compute the algebra again, it, it turns out that it's still exactly the same algebra. So there's a good geometric reason for this. But uh, in practice, uh, this is how it works. And then you can look at how these generators appear from the point of view of a cut u is equal to zero of uh, sky plus. So how they look like from the point of view of the sphere. If you, and if you do that, uh, it means that you drop all terms which have a partial with respect to u. And it turns out that for instance, with that, you will lose all the Poincaré generators. So instead of representing them through First order differential operators, the Poincaré generators, sorry, the translation generator, you represent them through their coefficients, which are just functions on the sphere. And these functions turn out to be the four lowest uh, spherical harmonics. And then you work out the algebra and you see that uh, even at this cut, the Poincaré algebra, the Lorentz algebra is completely unchanged. Whereas if you want to correctly represent the boosts, you have to take this, uh, some weight of these functions into account. So you have a formula here, which, which tells you exactly what to do uh, because you have uh, kind of looked at the, how the algebra appears uh, at u is equal to zero. And then what Sachs has shown is that the structure, so if you study asymptotically flat spacetimes and you look at the diffeomorphisms that leave asymptotically flat spacetimes invariant, he has shown that then you find almost the same algebra than the Poincaré algebra described, described in these terms, except that uh, instead of having just the four lowest spherical harmonics, you have to allow for all spherical harmonics on the sphere. 
And these generators then uh, have been called super translations in the literature. But the, the same formula appear, and then it's also completely clear why the Poincaré algebra is a subalgebra of this uh, BMS4. There's a further simplification which tells you to use uh, stereographic coordinates on the sphere. And then the Lorentz algebra, of course, becomes these two chiral copies of uh, SL2R, and the generators then appear like uh, the Virasoro generators, except that you have the, only the lowest modes, minus one, zero, and one uh, sitting here. So what I would like to do is uh, give you a description of a core joint representation that is sufficiently general so that it covers both this standard BMS4 version and a more general version that you can have on the puncture plane. Uh, so you start with a two-dimensional conformally flat surface and the way uh, the metric is written is with this conformal factor which has a p and a p bar here in front. And then you ask uh, what kind of transformations leave this uh, two-dimensional metric in bucket. Of course, there is the conformal coordinate transformations, which are these chiral transformations that you have here. And then you have, of course, vile rescalings. But it turns out that if you think in terms of this P and this P bar, you all, all also have purely imaginary uh, vile rescalings. And the way to think about those is you should think about zwei binds. And if you think about zwei binds, adapted zwei binds to this tangent space metric, uh, the zwei bind turns out to be just determined by p and p bar as it should. And then it's of course clear that this uh, complex, uh, this purely imaginary while rescaling, uh, which is here, just denotes uh, a u1 rotation of the zwei binds among themselves. And the real part of, the, of this one is what is the standard vial transformation, which is here. Then basically you have uh, two pictures. You can work with either conformal fields in which your fields have uh, uh, tensor indices, uh, H or H bar, and you have transformation laws of this type. Or you can take your zwei binds and soldier and put all the, uh, the tensor indices into tangent space indices, and then you have scalars. So you have no longer have, of course, these transformation laws because they are compensated by the ones for the zwei binds, but the scalars transform, transform under these complex viral scalings with certain weights, which are, of course, related to the uh, conformal dimensions of the fields that you have studied. So these are called in this context the spin weight and the conformal weight. And then you should worry about uh, covariant derivatives. Uh, and of course, if you think about the covariant derivative on the sphere in these conformally flat uh, coordinates, there are very few gammas which are non-zero. They are all determined by the log of the conformal factor. Uh, and in principle, if you're interested in vial transformation, you should also worry about the vial connection. It turns out, however, that for all the constructions that I'm going to do, all weights are always such that the vial connection will never really play a role, even if, well, even if it uh, should. Uh, so this is a question of weights. So, uh, and then you can wonder, so let's forget about the wild connection and just wonder about the covariant derivative on the sphere. And you can ask how this covariant derivative on the sphere behaves uh, under this map, which tells you how to go from uh, tensor fields to weighted scales. And if you work it out, you see that this covariant derivative on the sphere in terms of these weighted scalars becomes this famous f and f bar derivative that has been introduced by uh, Newman and Penrose. And you see that up to factors of p and p bar, it's basically just the partial derivative of complex analysis, which is there. And these factors here, you have to put if you really want to be uh, on this. Okay. So much for that. So what are the ingredients uh, that one needs to build this core joint representation in an abstract way, in a sufficiently abstract way? So you need certain fields of uh, either conformal fields or weighted scalars, which have certain weights. And I will uh, jump from one description of the other without uh, making any difference. So the 
Translation generators will be described by a real field, which has weights minus one half, minus one half. And the chiral part of the Lorentz transformations will be fields with dimensions minus one and zero, and then the opposite one. And these ones have to satisfy a chiral condition. So the covariant derivative of this object uh, should be zero. And when you think about duets, uh, it turns out that the right weights for uh, linear momentum will be three half, three half. It has to be a real field. And for angular momentum, there is a similar weights that you have to give. But since angular momentum in the core joint representation, if you want the non-degenerate inner product, is, is folded uh, together with uh, a Lorentz generator. And this Lorentz generator are constrained by a linear differential equation. Uh, this angular momentum, you should define it through an equivalence class, which says that two such fields should be identified if they differ by a covariant derivative of the sphere of a field which has the right, uh, the right weights. So that's the, the first subtlety. So this uh, moment idea, there's equivalence classes that you have to consider. And uh, then if you write down the BMS4 algebra, the, the one that I have described uh, basically in the coordinates uh, before, if you write down this algebra in this abstract setting, it looks, uh, so the rotation part looks like two copies of the Virasoro algebra, except that the operator is, if you are working in terms of scalars, this adds operator. And uh, the action of the non-abelian generators on the abelian generator is given by a kind of standard action with a certain weight, which has to do with the fact that this T has minus one half weights here. So this is the, abstract uh, version of the BMS4 algebra. And more generally, so you have this non-abelian uh, subalgebra, which can be the Lorentz algebra on the sphere, or as we will see later, two copies of the uh, centerless Virasoro algebra in the case of the puncture plane. And these uh, objects here act completely, they have always a representation on weighted scalars or conformal fields where uh, everything is just determined by the weights of the fields. So, and in particular, what I have written here, this sigma is exactly this representation. Okay, and then you have to worry about the dual space. So the first uh, subtlety I already uh, explained is that you have to take equivalence classes, you have to have a pairing, which is non-degenerate, that's important for the core joint representation. This pairing in this case has a certain weight uh, if you work uh, either in terms of conformal fields or scalars. And the assumption for the construction to work is that the pairing should annihilate total derivatives. So these to covariant derivatives on the sphere should be annihilated by uh, the pairing, which is of course true for the inner product, for the standard inner product of the sphere. Uh, and then you see, okay, this is important for something. And then if you go, so you have the, the algebra, you have the inner product, and then it's just a matter of uh, uh, sitting down to work out this uh, cross product here, which as I told you, is going to tell you how, uh, if you act with uh, uh, a translation generator on uh, linear momentum, you produce angular. Uh, so this is this wedge product, and this is the version of the uh, dual representation of sigma. This, is, this tells you how the rotations act on linear momentum. Okay, and then, so this is the abstract version, and now you want to see how everything looks like concretely when you are on the sphere. So on the sphere, as I told you, stereographic coordinates are the way to go in order to achieve this conformally flat uh, metric. And the particularity on the sphere is that this chiral condition that you have, you, you have to restrict yourself to globally well-defined transformations. And globally well-defined transformations are given by these fractional linear transformations. And if you want the metric on the sphere to stay exactly the same after this conformal coordinate transformation, you have to do a compensating wild transformation whose coefficients are completely fixed by the conformal coordinate transformations that you're doing. So the 
So the pairing, as I told you, is the standard integral on the sphere and all assumptions are satisfied. So then you can work out all the formulas for the uh, algebra and for the group. Uh, and it turns out that this type of formulas are, are the ones that you see these days in this uh, celestial holography literature, sometimes just for the Lorentz part of the algebra, because this is how the Lorentz part of the algebra acts uh, at, uh, 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 on the celestial sphere. So if you want really concrete structure constants, you have to think about in what terms you have to expand all your functions. So this is the same than if you want to look at the Virasoro algebra and you don't want to, to talk about the commutator of uh, vector fields on the circle. If you really want the basis and structure constants, you have to find, uh, you have to expand your objects and the right, uh, the right functions to expand everything, and in fact, they are not really functions, is this so called spin weighted spherical harmonics. So they are like spher spherical harmonics, but they take into account this, this spin weight that all these uh, functions have. And then, if you expand objects in that, uh, then you get, uh, you get explicit structure constants. They are quite ugly, except if you, uh, the ones for the Lorentz generator, of course, are the sub algebra of the. Virasoro algebra, but all the other ones, when you really want to, to see, for instance, in the algebra, how uh, the Lorentz uh, generators act on super translations, they are, they are quite complicated. One thing that I will need for my construction is the following property of uh, spin-weighted spherical harmonics. And this is what I learned from uh, Penrose and Rindler. So it turns out that you can organize your spin weighted spherical harmonics in such a triangle. And they explain in their book that for each weighted scalar, there is a certain combination of this covariant derivative on the sphere, which again gives a weighted scalar. So you expect this to be, of course, the case if you take the vile covariant derivative, but for this non vile covariant derivative, it's only certain combinations which again have good transformations and they give these combinations and they explain you two things in this uh, chapter. So the one thing that they explain is, for instance, we have this chiral condition that we have on the rotation generators and uh, so they show that this chiral condition is a three-dimensional complex space exactly as it should be. But they also explain that this Lorentz invariant subspace of spin weighted spherical harmonics is the same than the subspace that you get from this third order differential equation. So this first order equation and this third order differential equation, which is precisely the right weight here, describe exactly the same solutions which are sitting here. And of course, there is also the dual situation where they say that if you take equivalence classes like that, taking these equivalence classes and equivalence classes of functions up to third order derivatives on the sphere, they describe exactly the same set of uh, three dimensional, uh, three dimensional, uh, the three dimensional vector space. Okay, and if you are crazy enough, you might also want to describe uh, the Poincaré algebra and, uh, uh, and its co-adjoint representation in these terms. And then you see that the only difference is that you have to put these differential uh, conditions on the super translation generators, which cut down the super translations just again back to the four first spherical harmonics. And you do the same for linear momentum. So this gives also an abstract description from the point of view of the sphere of the Poincaré algebra and its coadjoint representation. Okay, let me talk one minute about the punctured plane since I have done this uh, a bit. So sometimes then it's also interesting to uh, do this vile transformation and go uh, to the Riemann sphere. And then instead of staying on the Riemann sphere, you add two punctures and so you remove the point at the origin and the point at infinity. And then as usual in conformal field theory, you don't look anymore at the algebra of all infinitesimal local conformal transformations. So you, you do no longer look at the algebra of the globally well-defined uh, well transformations, but you look at all possible local generators. And on the plane, of course, there is no longer any difference between uh, 
between weighted scalars and conformal fields, P is equal to one, so you just can talk about this uh, uh, conformal fields. But the, only, the difference then is the space of functions in which you expand everything. So now the right functions to expand are these uh, polynomial functions or this, uh, so, uh, or, or this Laurent series that you are looking at. And the good pairing to define the extended uh, BMS algebra on the puncture plane is to, uh, uh, to take residues because this pairing again has all good properties. It annihilates total derivatives and it is a non-degenerate pairing for such uh, series. So what you gain by that is that uh, these uh, conformal coordinate transformations now are of course much more general and they only need to, uh, they don't need uh, uh, to be globally well defined any longer and uh, much more general things are allowed. And for instance, you can use that for the standard uh, conformal mapping between the uh, puncture plane and the cylinder if you really want to see how the structure goes from one setting to another. Okay, and of course, then in that case, it turns out that structure constants become extremely transparent. They become just m minus n with now no longer any restrictions on. So m is now uh, integer. And also the core joint representation, you just have very simple commutation relations, which in fact are the leading commutation relations to some in some approximation to what you see on the sphere. But on the sphere, there is less functions and these ones are correct. Okay, and let me finish with trying to tell you how to identify this uh, core joint representation in uh, uh, asymptotically flat spacetimes. What you should do, what you learn from your classical mechanics books, is that probably the core joint representation has to do with uh, the conserved quantities of neutral charges. So we are trying to build those. Uh, and uh, in this case, everything is a bit more complicated because it's gravity and uh, neutral charges in gravity are not so, so easy. So the way it goes is that, uh, and forget about notation, but so asymptotically flat uh, solutions in a certain sense are completely determined by giving certain components of the vial tensor at uh, null infinity and of the asymptotic part of the shear. And at the same time, giving a certain co component of, uh, again, the vial tensor at fixed U. And it turns out that if you give this data, this is like giving uh, initial data, except that it's a characteristic initial value problem that completely determines your solution. And the only thing that is that has undetermined U dependence is the time derivative, or is, is this asymptotic part of the shear. And this derivative here you call the news. And if you work out in these terms, so first of all, you have a parameterization of your general asymptotically flat solutions. And then you can look at how the BMS4 transformation act on these uh, coordinates for solutions. You get fairly complicated things, but some of the transformation law remind you of what you have seen in the core joint representation. Uh, and then you build the current algebra for this uh, for this system, and it turns out that this current algebra has exactly the properties that you expect, except that the current algebra is broken by the gravitational flux that leaks out uh, at null infinity. Okay, so you have non-conservation, but this is not what we want when we study the uh, the core joint representation. So you can also look at at the time component of the current, and it turns out that this psi zero two plus psi zero two bar piece is what contains the bonding mass of the of the curved black hole, for instance, and this quadratic piece in sigma and sigma dot is what encodes the contributions of the gravitons to uh, the bonding mass. And here is what you think should be angular momentum and the complex conjugate. So. In order to find the core joint representation, it's of course interesting to have a conserved current algebra. So what you are doing is you are concentrating on non-radiative space times. So you might think that if you are looking at non-radiative space times, so you switch off the news and at the same time you switch off some components of the vial tensor, you might think you have nothing left. That's not completely true. 
because you have almost the same sector left that you have in three-dimensional gravity. So you have still black holes. You, you don't have gravitational waves, but you do have black holes and these kind of objects. And then you compare what remains of these conserved charges now, and you compare their transformation law to the ones of the core joint representation that I have just shown you before. And it turns out that this kind of components and these objects here, there is then a completely well-defined map from this gravitational data, which forms a representation of BMS to the core joint representation, if you take this business of equivalence classes into account. Uh, so I need one more minute to finish. I hope this is okay. So you look yeah, at this fine. So you look at this transformation law, you see that this is on the nose what you expect for linear momentum. And then you do the computation of this object that you think is angular momentum. And the first line is exactly what you expect. And the last line is at first sight not. But then you realize that if you organize everything of the last line, it can be organized into at bar of something and the third derivative of something. But then you know that if you fold this with a Lorentz generator, this is to be considered trivial because a Lorentz generator satisfies this chiral condition and also this at three equal to zero. So if you map to the equivalence class, this is zero. So the conclusion is that you have a, a perfect, if you want to call it pre-momentum map in non-radiative space times that tells you exactly where the core joint representation is sitting uh, in your gravitational data. And this business about the weights, three halves, three halves. So there was a controversy about that in the celestial holography literature, but here this group theory should really clean that up, except that of course this has nothing to do with gravitons because you really switch them off. So this has really to do with the black hole sector, the group theory sector, and the, gravi the graviton sector is on top of all of that. So there, there's interesting questions remaining, but, uh, uh, maybe let me stop here. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, so you were talking about two Verasara algebras that you get on this uh, S2. Uh, yes. What are the central charges that you encounter? Uh, very good. So, oh, oh, okay, they are not really on S2. Huh? You have to do the punctured S2 to, to help. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, but 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 this is fine. If you have them, you can find the central charge, and you can see it basically here. Uh, it's basically this kind of objects here. So we have studied this in another paper. The point is that it's not. It depends on the field of the theory. It's not like in ADS three a constant central charge, but it depends on the asymptotic part of the shear in order to have the right dimension, if you want. Mm -hmm. So it's really a central charge. Not in a Lie algebra, but rather in a more general structure, which is a Lie algebra. So it really depends on, on this field. And then you see that the field, if for the curved black hole, you would like to know the value of the field for the curved black hole just to play the usual game, maybe. It turns out to be zero for the curved black hole, but not if you transform to the cylinder, because then you get the constant shift and then you have a number but nobody has been able to do, <laughs> to do some sense out of this classical number, which would be the analog of the Brownino uh, for this kind of situation. So people have played many games, but uh, okay, I have stayed. But do you time. typically get negative central charges in such cases? No, or? well, this, this depends on what the sigma zero then ultimately is, because the central charge will depend on that. So I have not explicitly written it down here. I, well, I will maybe try to show you in the discussion session uh, where I can put up the, the, the formula where you can see what it looks like if you're interested. It depends on the modes of, this, uh, of, of these fields, which you also have to expand. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is what it will depend on. And one, one last question. You were talking about spin-weighted spherical harmonics, uh, and it looked uh, like you had uh, some sum of SU2 representations with spin zero, one half mm -hmm. one. And I've seen this type of structure in W infinity algebras. Mm -hmm. 
Is there any connection with that? Well, 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 well we have heard uh, even Professor Ivanov talk before about harmonic superspace. I mean, this X and X bar is exactly the same that they are using in harmonic superspace. Uh, it's exactly the same, except that, well, the way Penrose and Rindler use them, so they are all over the place, uh, spin weighted spherical harmonics, but mm. they are. They exist in the gravitational wave literature, but they also exist in harmonic superspace. And there are different implementations. And there's one SU2 implementation, uh, mm -hmm. which is probably the nicest one. And that's the one uh, Ivanov and collaborators are using, actually. So, okay. so, so indeed, yes, it's uh, mm -hmm. the, the, exactly the same object. The notations is a bit different, uh, I would say. Yeah, more questions, please. Uh... Yes. Uh, Ivanov has a question, I think. Yes, yes. Uh, please. Ah, it's good. Uh, I have uh, not, not, not question, but uh, some remark. I think that if you would use uh, notation in terms of harmonic, a lot of your formulas uh, would be much simpler, look, uh, look much simpler. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. this Y, M, N, and so on. But uh, just uh, should see, uh, this notation could simplify uh, sharply your uh, formulas. I, I, excre I, I agree to some extent with you, of course, because I have now seen papers in the gravitational wave literature where they make exactly the same point that you have been doing in your book a long time ago, how to work with these harmonics, right? And so they are doing exactly the same thing, describing them from the SU2 cross uh, point of view and that they are not functions on the sphere, etc. So we tried at some stage to use it in this language, but the point is that since all these gravity asymptotically flat solutions are written in this language already with X and X bar, uh, the connection to what happens in the gravitation in the Newman Penrose literature is a bit easier if you keep their if you keep their approach. But but of course this is this D plus plus operator that you have, and uh, uh, this depends what you want to do. But of course you're right. Uh, by the way, this uh, for instance for volume preserving diffeomorphisms on the sphere were considered many years ago in the harmonic language by Emil Sakachev and uh, um, I forgot his name. I forgot his name. Maybe it could be related to your... To your okay, I, 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 I think the, the version with volume preserving diffeomorphism is not the one that we have been having. That's the one that has been looked at now recently. So. Uh, you can see that you can also do diff S2 semi-direct product with S2 just by dropping this chiral condition. But people also have looked at, at uh, volume preserving ones, especially Fredel and these people. That's not the exact setup that I have been looking at, but uh, yeah, okay, these people begin to, to play this game as well. But I don't think here it's really volume preserving. It's really uh, to, so it is really either Lorenz or the two copies of Virazoro for me. So this would be volume preserving of the three sphere, three dimensional sphere. Uh, two sphere. Two, two sphere. Uh -huh. You mean area? Standard, area not, uh, it's a standard sphere, I think. It's a paper by Sakash and Siesgin. So maybe you should tell Laurent Friedel that you should, uh, this is what he should say. Right? No. <laughs> this is not, because specifically, really, my talk was specifically about Lorenz on the sphere or about uh, Virazor on the punctured plane, I would say, and mm -hmm. then the semi direct uh, structure. There was actually, I noticed a paper in uh, the latest uh, archive uh, emailing by Strominger where he was writing something similar about W1 plus infinity, some connection with celestial holography. Oh, of course, this is, uh, mm -hmm. of course, very much. So yeah, there is a new paper that I need to read. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we're close to the end of the period. So yeah, let's thank uh, Glenn again.